In Destiny, there exists a common firearm with a legendary status, what some would consider to be the paradigm of the kinetic damage archetype, a weapon that when placed within capable hands is able to unleash devastation on the battlefield and earn respect from even the most mommyest of milkies. I'm talking of course about the Damage Traveler's Chosen, a weapon of a more civilized age. Bolstering an impressive nine bullets in the magazine and the damage equivalent of wearing socks and stepping on a drop of water. With Bungie slated to release a new legendary campaign in their upcoming DLC Lightfall, where the dark and depressing atmosphere of what was supposed to be the second coming of the apocalypse was instead replaced by Cyberpunk 2077 without the story, I knew that there was a chance for honor, glory, and prestige in the table if this Hot Wheels parking lot prophet would pick up his damaged Traveler's Chosen once again to continue his good work. Despite the Traveler's Chosen being considered a weapon of unyielding power, with an insane amount of respect and love in the community. It is still often considered to be a weapon that many wouldn't even wipe their ass with. The certified worst weapon in the game. So gather up your LC Bray body pillow and join me, the We Have Esoteric at Home of Destiny, while I wake the fuck up, Guardian, and line my frontal cortex with blood clots and brain aneurysms, firing nearly 30,000 bullets directly into my will to live. For your sick enjoyment, as we pose the question, can you beat Lightfall using only a damaged traveler's chosen. Even though this gun has an impressively threatening aura, to say this run was anything other than a colonoscopy with a wide-angle Nikon lens camera would be lying. The unyielding torment this run unleashed upon my sphincter was pure agony. Any damaged traveler's challenge that I undertake inside of Destiny stand out as some of the most proud of stains on my Destiny achievement underwear. For some, it's their god roll weapon that they spent ages grinding for. For others, it's the sacred act of the Olo Flawless. God damn it, Riley, you covered the S. <laughs> and for those like my myself. It's firing thousands of bullets out of your nerf gun towards a thresher, hoping that the missile they unleashed in your direction hasn't been blessed by the FPS gods as they choose mercy and untie the damage from your frame rate, granting you another shot at life. Spoiler alert, you can call me Ronald McDonald because I'm McFucking Head. <laughs> Before we dive into the campaign, come, take a seat by Papa Rye, and warm your hands by the fire. Let me talk to you about the damage Traveler's Chosen. When it comes to damage output, yeah nah, we ain't got that. This gun is unmoddable, has only 9 bullets in the magazine, and a single per frame. Well-rounded, reliable, and sturdy. Pretty much the antithesis to your average Destiny YouTuber. You got any silver? Please! Our story begins with a battle to save our Sky Daddy golf ball from Smoky Megamind's invading forces. After about 10 years of doing nothing but extremely vague gestures. The Traveler says, fuck it, laser beam. Get terraformed, idiot. Then the original fire team from all the promotional material decides to charge the witness in their Acadia class jump ship. The first one you get in the entire Destiny franchise. That thing was like Bungie's game engine when we first found it, held together with rubber bands and Elmer's glue. We found it in a junkyard and these three ass clowns decide to charge the embodiment of entropy, gliding through a light beam. The same light that they use on a regular basis to vaporize enemies while they're battling amongst the stars. The witness slices them into more pieces than my soul after scrapping my ninth pinnacle in a row. When will you learn, Riley? And Zavala tells us that we're in no position to engage the enemy, considering they just told our god to knock it off after firing the most devastating attack we've seen it do to date. To start this challenge run off right, I disrespect my arsenal by putting away my meta loadouts that actively repulse any female within viewing distance and equip a weapon with some actual chest hair. Just attempting to harness the raw sexual energy of this weapon plunges my power level a solid 20 points. Exotic armor is usually used as a way to supplement the killing power of your loadout and add that little chef's kiss to the cheeks of your powerful, carefully chosen weapons. But much like what is taught in middle school multiplication, multiplying god tier gear by straight up donkey ass still equals doo doo cream. Exotics really don't give that Zenkai boost that will align the gaming chakra, allowing you to see through the code in order to somehow make this gun viable. Rubbing together all two of my brain cells, I still manage to land on chromatic fire, allowing precision shots with with kinetic weapons to explode the same damage type of your subclass, and sacred filaments is my way of surviving the onslaught of enemies that will beat my ass like I owed them money by giving me devour without having to use my grenade. A plan that the learned will understand quickly falls apart when you realize that a slap from grandma would hurt more than an entire magazine from the gun, often leading to my devour disappearing quicker than the self-respect of a gambit main. Even though death is at our doorstep, I decided to pick a much more manageable target than chasing the embodiment of darkness in my dog shit dump ship. You see, I 
pick my battles. I've been crossed off the census by a normal cabal phalanx that did a couple more extra bicep curls than usual, dropping the might of a fucking demigod on my temples. I absolutely don't got the go-go juice to fight darkness incarnate. My star devil predator and I roll up on the exterior of a cabal ship, ready to steam some fucking hams. The ship engages hyperdrive, but Riley has been drinking his milk. Calcium deficient no more. Instead of traveling faster than the speed of light ripping my arms off, I'm simply built different. Jokes aside, I love cutscenes like this. Nothing hits harder than seeing your ship and carefully curated fashion in a cutscene doing something wild like this. I even love when Gaul bitch smacked me across the stratosphere like a DBZ villain and straight up humiliated my ass. Your light is mine. Harder daddy. Even though Callus has been imbued with the power of the witness, he must have been shaking in his boots when he heard that the guardian he's been grooming to join him by promise of riches has stowed away on one of his ships ready to come after him. Upon crawling through the vents like the demonic little sewer rat that I am, I was able to tap into and fully unlock the gaming chakra. The cabal on this ship couldn't prepare for the ass slapping I was dishing out at nearly every twist and turn. I moved through the entire ship, annihilating everything that got in my way. Since this is the opening, the damage is still pretty acceptable, something that would slowly leech as the power level of the missions continues to rise. Eventually a tormentor decides to tussle with the muscle, but me being a warrior of the Chadley type, a beacon of sheer, unyielding masculinity. To say I was prepared for this was an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, using my intimidation tactics was more than enough to cause the tormentor to retreat in fear, and I enter a darkness zone to destroy the navigational device of the ship. I stomp these turtles like I was Mario on crack cocaine, and walk outside to a gorgeous backdrop as Callus's ship, the Typhon Imperator, rolls in. I love when Bungie uses this sense of scale. Being a tiny being trying to survive in a war of paracausal entities, duking it out on a universal scale is such a neat concept, and it's moments like these that really showcase how small and insignificant significant we may seem, and that despite that fact, in the end, we have the ability to make big changes. Destiny is at its best when you feel small in a universe that feels so much larger than you. Whoa, Bungie, not like that! <laughs> Put it away! Whoa. Nice car. The incendiaries on these asteroids play me for a fool by using the strongest weapon in the Cabal's arsenal, that being Bungie's physics engine to launch me off into the cold depths of space. My ultra instinct kicked in and I prime a Nova Bomb, but quickly realized that that would be a violation of my challenge run restrictions and quickly swapped targets towards Neomuna. I can just imagine someone trying to upload themselves to Zuckerberg's metaverse before the Cabal invasion begins and just getting fucking neutrino starred from above. In true Riley Reloaded fashion, I refuse to swap up my tactics and learn my lessons because learning is for fucking nerds, causing the incendiaries to spread my cheeks like a meal from Taco Bell. I finally destroy the cabal and cross the chasm to continue my rampage. You see, Papa Rai is nothing if not mechanical. It's true that I am learned in the ways of fix it and repair, capable of understanding all sorts of engineering words like wrench and nuts. But as a guardian, there's only one type of fixing that we understand, the kind chambered in nine millimeter. Can't expect God to do all the work. So I float my dress wearing warlock ass around the room, pelting the cabal in the head with a thousand nerf darts. Even though the enemies in the reactor are shielded, this early in the challenge run means I can unleash devastation with each of my nine bullets in the magazine. After the final reactor meets BULLET, the ship goes into a self-destructive state harder than my destiny addiction, and we make for our getaway in the engine bay. If you've been around this channel for long enough, you would know that Flatlanders unleashed a government-mandated psyop to denounce the good teachings of Walmart Jesus, saying that you can survive a fall from any height as long as you land on flat ground. A conspiracy theory that I've consistently disproven over the course of my destiny career by shattering my ankles harder than the fucking Elden Ring. What a conspiracy theorist even got to Uncle Bungie is in an official twab. They tried to gaslight me by saying that physics deaths would no longer insta-kill you and instead leave you at a single cheek-clenching hit point. So imagine my surprise when this phalanx decided to unleash 30 cc's of pure impact damage directly into my fucking ribcage. The Cabal in the engine bay have more tactical awareness than my teams in trials and aren't afraid to use their shield on a vantage point. Dealing the damage equivalent of trusting a fart too much means that any shielded enemy puts a halt on anything I do. Damn, I hate it when I shard. I can't even trust the fart. If you're like me and have the attention span of a toddler, anytime you're not actively dealing damage feels agonizing. But with enough time, I clear out the room and move on to the next darkness zone. The speed at which my super soaker is able to kill anything other than my life expectancy is exceedingly painful. This room sends out scions that will pelt you in the ass. A legion of shielded enemies and phalanx that are backed by that bungee branch of the Illuminati. It became clear very quickly that Void was not the way to go. So with a quick switch to the only thing a warlock main is good for, that being 
being I'm born to Nova, forced to well, I managed to clear out the bay extremely quickly. The tormentor that ran away at the sheer overwhelming masculinity I dunked on it finally worked up the courage to try and face Riley Chan once again. The tormentors were Bungie's solution to a new enemy type. They possess immense strength, a high health pool, and a moveset unlike anything we've seen in the Destiny franchise. Meaning much like a midget at a urinal, I was gonna need to stay on my toes. And what could only be considered true poetry, a self-fulfilling prophecy, the tormentor grabs me, sucking me good and hard through my jorts so hard, he sent me straight to fucking God. <laughs> Despite what I said about tormentors being a threatening enemy, pushing the boundaries of anything that Bungie has created to date, there was no way they could prepare for the ass monkey you'd usually put on ad clear. As I looked deep within Bungie's spaghetti engine to exploit the AI like you would a Skyrim dragon, being of pure darkness, an auger of agony, the essence of pain, I'm literally shitting and coming right now, versus a man with a mental deficiency and a dream. All I can say is get tormented, idiot. This was surprisingly easy. People were asking me, Rai, how are you gonna deal with the tormentors in your next runs? Believe it or not, they were actually the easiest part of it all. Statistically, there is few things in the Destiny universe that transmog guardians into an obituary more than that of a surprise cabal drop pod. I love how Osiris just jumps right inside, looking like a three-year-old in a booster seat, and just says, random bullshit, go! This is the kind of humor I can get behind. It got a really good kick out of me the first time I saw it in my Lightfall playthrough. After we launch ourselves towards Neo Muna and land in the city, giving the Cabal a taste of their own medicine, the Silver Surfers fly above. Horse cock Nimbus upon hearing where Light Bears mocks the name. You on the road. Identify yourself. Are you with the invaders? We're guardians from the last city. Basically calling us cringe. As a Destiny player over the past decade and engaging with the community via LFG, nah, I 100% agree. I know what we're like. <laughs> I spent 12 hours in Vault of Glass day one. I fight my way through the gorgeous streets of a city that basically said, Earth is getting annihilated by a cataclysmic event. Peace, asshole, and hit away. But don't worry, hear me, good people of Neo Muna. Much like you, I too said adios, muchachos, and made like a tree and got the fuck out of there to come here. Save Earth from the embodiment of darkness? Did you see what it did to those other guys? I think not. I Choose life. As we move through the streets of this city, we begin to see the strings that hold the universe together and approach the rippling power of Baja Blast. I feel the energy of the universe writhing within me as the blood in my mountain dew veins is replaced by the god's nectar and we get our first taste of Strand. I was ready, now fully primed, with a grappling hook to fly around the arena like Spider-Man. But instead of super strength, speed, and cat-like reflexes, I got brain damage from Spider-Man. Let's get this. <laughs> Holy shit. Ooh! Even though the Shadow Legion pulled a godly play by deciding to glide their cabals across my forehead via the drop pond delivery method, when I returned, I was demonic. No amount of preparation could have prepared them for the devastation I unleashed upon my foes. I pranked them harder than when I placed a wood chipper under the McDonald's ball pit. All that ass I was spanking with my hot dog water weaponry must have overexerted myself, causing the Hot Wheels man to shiitake as mushrooms and drop to the floor just in time for the Cloud Striders to be formally introduced via a cutscene. Thankfully, they were fighting a normal a legionary and not a phalanx because they would have had their souls vacated from their body with the might of a demigod the moment they got too close. They then let Osiris out of his drop pod by ripping the door off the front and this crusty senile old man comes out preloaded, ready to show the shadow legion why these hands are rated E for everyone. But seeing as his ghost got exploded off camera and he no longer has the power of the light to augment his strength and survivability, I'm pretty sure his clothes would get folded with him still in him. The moment he tried to fight back, one punch directly into the old folks home or buried under it. It's then we bear witness to the sexiest creature in the Destiny universe. Donning new drip as Callus shows us why fashion over function is truly superior. Callus tries to toast the tormentors, but they must truly be beacons of torment and agony because they leave him hanging and cringing hard in a failed handshake skill check. Callus, you're at your peak. You gonna let these two turbo virgins style on you like that? This is a crime punishable by exile and a two hour cry session in the shower. The witness then shows up and tells Callus to get it together and find the veil, signaling that I beat first contact with only a damaged traveler's chosen. In Under Siege, I fully take the gloves off, allowing myself to fully tap into the true potential of a warlock main, as I get rid of those stupid, dirty, vagrant thoughts of using a subclass other than Well of Radiance from my head, and fully lean into the well potential instead of trying to resist it. I don the Phoenix Protocol, and when painted with the Hot Wheels color scheme, I become an Augur of Death. Well of Radiance allows for shield-piercing rounds to cut straight through any phalanx that gets in my way. Well is extremely potent, the beacon of the warlock class. As your average solar enjoyer, there is only two things that would make me bust out the wallet faster than a titan main offered a 64 pack of gourmet crayons. That would be this monkey. Yo, why do thrift stores have the most random shit? Like, what is this bro? Who's gonna buy this? 
and the other would be an ornament for Starfire Protocol. Nothing is more devastating to our fragile egos than wiping our asses with the raid boss, stealing the highest DPS out of the entire team, and then getting clowned on for looking like an asshole. Warlocks are near the double-edged sword state that Heart of Inmost Light was in, because the moment Bungie releases an ornament for our favorite exotic, prepare for it to be nerfed deep into the crust of the earth that we abandoned. With Phoenix Protocol giving me 50% of my super, I'm able to blow through this opening section with unrelenting atrocities. That's not to say that Papa Rai had a cakewalk with this because I've had a taste of good weaponry, and nearly every enemy I fight is a painful reminder that I'd have more fun taking a bath with a toaster as I hear this sound. Over and over and over again for hours of my life. Madness. It appears I've been inflicted with insurmountable madness. We then get thrown way back in time as Bungie forgets the carefully crafted mission design they've been developing over the eight years of the Destiny franchise's lifetime by taking us all the way back to D1 to guard a gate from waves of enemies as Ghost lowers a shield. Little did the Shadow Legion know that I'm capable of unspeakable evils, like hiding the TV remote and leaving the toilet seat up. Downright diabolical. After clearing the Cabal, I move towards the boss fight of the mission where I am once again cucked by Uncle Bungie as they drop a super suppression field on my donkey ass. And to rub salt in my wounds, the fight has shielded enemies, which the shield-piercing properties of my Well of Radiance would allow me to clear easily if I could use it. The boss itself takes about as much damage as me banging my limp wiener against his leg would deal, and the shielded enemies keep me at a distance. The amount of ads cause my weapon to shake harder than I do when I'm on an 18-hour editing binge or enough caffeine to kill an African elephant. For those of you who are a stout in the ways of the damage Traveler's chosen, that means I can't hit shit. <laughs> Bungie carefully aligned their gaming chakra, tapping into the essence deep within themselves to find the best methods to kick any chance at happiness I'd have in this DLC directly in the dick. With only nine bullets in the magazine, the dogs Bungie constantly respond behind you while you're fighting the phalanxes forces you to unleash your inner ATF agent and gun them down mid-fight. This severely slows down your killing speed. And since my super was the only way I- Four-minute flight. Isn't that something? Amplified. <laughs> it's like peeing into the wind. <laughs> this took way longer than it should have. I switched my exotic to a Ophidian aspect to up my DPS via reload speed, and after gunning down Valorn by way of a thousand cuts, we are treated to yet another cutscene. Our guardian says, we're too late, they got the veil. Which at this point, I'm unsure if they're talking about the building or an object, but before I can ponder on the questions, my ghost is hijacked by the witness in order to zoom call Callus right in front of me. During this call, my character just stands there with his thumb up his ass while this evil entity uses the source of his power as an intercom. We've got a long and storied history with Callus, and you're telling me you don't have any questions about this? Because because I do. Why the hell do I sound like Buzz Lightyear? Four minute flight. Isn't that something? <laughs> Cyrus and Nimbus need to hear about this. Even though they were possessed right in front of me and my ghost pleaded saying I shouldn't be here, my guardian decides to rely on the power of friendship by saying, We're in this together. Nah, man, that's an issue we should probably address. The darkness that has been shown to have an insane amount of power by straight up slicing a guy in half and resisting the Traveler's Omega Beam possess the thing that grants you your ability to revive and use Discord Nitro to video call his friend. And we're just gonna gloss over that. Extrapolate the data, that's bad news. Once the mission downfall begins, I launch myself off the edge. And what can only be considered divine relevation, I find myself vindicated in my flat landing conspiracy theories as I jump down from the ledge and watch my fucking ankles explode on on impact. <laughs> That's right, you fucking donkey. Put another coin in the Riley Jones was right jar. Because I've once again got proof of the bungee mandated psyop. Everyone told me that fall damage protection exists in this game. That you could jump off a seraph station, and as long as you landed on anything less than two degree angle, you will always survive. I once again proven you deep state feds wrong. <laughs> With my chest stuck out in triumph over the basic rules of gravity, I hit the NOS on my bumper car and rock it off towards the Neo Muno Rainbow Road in order to enter Callus's ship. Using my Well of Radiance against the enemies that guard the front gate made each soft slap my gun dealt to their heads a little more bearable. These challenge runs are not only damaging to my mental fortitude, but also have been a killing blow to a myriad of different controllers. The first damage Traveler's Chosen run in the Witch Queen had me firing my gun so much that it gave my controller a permanent squeak on the trigger. I remember sitting there in the dark around 3am, growing a brain tumor with each horrible squeak as I pressed buttons so fast and furious that not even family could hold my controller together. Only to get splattered along the ground and have to reset an encounter and hear that squeak all over again. But under the cover of broad daylight, I stealthily rupture a new rectum across every single enemy as I blow through Callus's ship at a breakneck pace. While 90% of the vanguard is currently stuck in a Family Guy style cutaway, I'm unsure as to why Callus just didn't park his ship right beside the veil. Actually, you know what? It's probably hard to park such a behemoth and all things considered, he got pretty close. But with me being forklift certified, it means that I am obligated to call his parking dog shit, even if it's damn near perfect. From what I can tell, the only defense 
defenders of Neo Muna consist of me and the jackhammer, and the veil is deep within the crust of Neo Muna. Just park that bitch on top of it, line the front door with a thousand threshers and scorpius turrets, I ain't never getting in. In fact, I'ma just call it a day. Darkness wins. Universe is done for. Fighting through the ship and witnessing Bungie's art team even making a dark and depressing color palette of black and brown in the pyramids unfold into the light of God onto your eyeballs is downright mesmerizing. The music and art team have always been bar none some of the brightest minds in the Destiny sphere. I roll up on some sleeping dogs and waste no time in harnessing my inner euthanasia. I peed a style on this dog and the other one just sleeps right through the bullets going off right inside of his ears. I understand entirely how can you be expected to fight the Guardian Menace when you are the Shadow Legion's sleepiest guy. I old yeller him like EA did to Anthem and this run did to my self-esteem and move on to the vehicle bay. This fight pretty much goes the way that everything so far has been going. Agonizingly slow, but with how many of these runs I've done, I've transcended beyond my mortal limits, being able to demolish my enemies as though I was using a good weapon. Something I vastly take for granted as this run goes from a walk in the park to spin jitsu kicking me directly in the nipples. My coach! Oh, my coach is gonna kill me! I get mesmerized by this plate's activation animation, and once everything has been whittled away like my sanity, an orb drops that will overload the machinery in this bay. I grab it, causing more ads to spawn in, extending the torment of my sore trigger finger. I had to drop the orb in order to deal damage, and thankfully it doesn't despawn, allowing my rampage to continue. Once I dunk it into the receptacle, everyone begins cheering that we lessen the load of threshers and tanks, crippling the Shadow Legion. But the only thing crippled was the presentation of this, because out of all the tanks and threshers in the bay, we only blew up like four of them. This ship is almost the size of a fucking city. We blew up four tanks and clapped our hands. Call it a day. My work here done, boys. Pack it up. Certified Riley Reloaded moment as we do as little as possible and take all the credit. This absolute unit of a tormentor radiates pure testosterone as it dives into the room like a Dark Souls boss. I thought I would get my ass beat like Gordon Ramsay cooking in an omelet, but Bungie made a critical error when creating this room by placing a ledge at the back, allowing me to style on him. I honestly thought the tormentors would be a bit more of a problem. I do believe, though, that this deserves a certified get tormented idiot moment as I plant him like a fucking tree. With the tormentor crossed off the witness's census, I slippery slide my ass into the grav lift, which is more jittery than a hunter main who took a single hit point of damage in the crucible. I try to open the doorway to the final encounter of this mission, but these scions combine the anime power of friendship to defeat the god enemy. We'll use the power of friendship. Shattering all of my bones, and upon returning, I unleash hellfire upon them. To say this final boss fight wasn't a stress-inducing, painful slog would be lying. So far, most things in this DLC get bent over and taken down to Flavortown at an extremely quick rate. When I roll in with the damage travelers chosen, encounters fall at my feet. But this encounter, even with good gear, has you giving it your all while a legion of enemies fire at you from all sides. There is a lot of open space to get pelted in the ass from, and the taken phalanx in the middle will not hesitate to hit you with their orbs that have the tracking capacity of a goddamn canine unit. They are bloodhounds, and a single hit from them is enough to knock your health bar down to half. Bungie must have used the scientific method because they thought of nearly every way to rupture my sphincter without lubricant on the molecular level. If you do manage to get your footing and kill the taken phalanx amidst the horde of enemies, you're not safe until you complete the objective because they continuously respawn. Hiding up here isn't even a good cheese because Bungie made warbees come down to take their revenge for all the PETA basic human decency violations I've achieved over my challenge run career. If you do manage to bang your nuts against enough foreheads in this arena and struggle your way to victory, your reward was yet another Watashiwa on your penis, as grabbing Strand takes away your well of radiance, survivability, and killing power. I started this encounter at 45 minutes in the recording and walked away at two hours and a half with my soul fractured into more pieces than this narrative. You needed to be perfect. The movement and positioning and do your best to not wither away from old age with how little damage you deal. Not only does grabbing Strand respawn nearly the entire arena, meaning that after an agonizing round one, you are destined to suffer once again as the round two bell rings. On the second go, Bungie didn't even spit on their hands before they committed atrocities against my well-being by taking the bloodhound taken orbs that could solo flawless the wipeout course and increasing the number of them from two to five. Five! Mm. Now this, this was torture. <laughs> the grapple allows me to maneuver around the room and position myself pretty well, and in an arena where you have to be perfect, your boy was able to pull it off. After enough resets to brick a PS4, I 
was finally free. Strand once again finds itself too powerful for me to wield, granting me a tummy ache. Kyle shows up just in the nick of time to free me from this personal hell and I begin my Halo-style warthog run to try and achieve my freedom. I drive like hell because I had no idea if this counter is a separate encounter, and you bet your ass I am not willing to find out. But with determination and Hot Wheels fury, I was a greasy little guy, dodging everything in an impressive way, and be downfall with only a damaged traveler's chosen. The people of Neomuna, upon hearing that an attack was imminent, used all their superior technology to upload themselves to Zuckerberg's metaverse. But the thing about turning your consciousness into a virtual reality is that you're subject to all sorts of evils like TOS and an off button. This mission has us diving deep within the Neomuna power grid to stop the Vex from pushing the power button and deleting all user data. When I roll into the front porch of the reactor building, my soul is vacated from my body by the legion of Cyclops that guard the front gate. On Legendary, a direct hit from these energy-dense behemoths will vaporize my jaded warlock ass, sending me on the express bus to the ether. It winds up being no match for immortality abuse as I litter the airspace of the front with both my corpse and atoms of my corpse, and I continue to move through the facility where I reach one of the most perplexing puzzles in the entire Destiny franchise. After around eight years, Bungie decided to switch up the formula and make this door destructible. Normally, doors are immortal and lead to a black void where enemies walk out of. What kind of sick joke is this, Bungie? <laughs> Bungie could sprinkle these all over the map, and it would trigger my inner schizo. It's like in a FromSoft game where you get tricked by a mimic or accidentally hit an illusory wall and all of a sudden you have deep-seated trust issues against inanimate objects that not even a licensed psychiatrist could pry from your mind. Oh boy, prize, what's it gonna be? Oh boy, oh boy, I love prizes. It's, 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 it's with Well of Radiance and Phoenix Protocol at my side, nothing could stand in my way. Keep in mind, my Hot Wheels disciples, that what is quick jump cuts for you is agonizing hours of gameplay for me. With great effort, I finally activate a third brain cell, allowing me to apply the kinetic surge buff to my gun when I get rapid kills in quick succession. It's nothing groundbreaking, but after firing this gun for hours on end, any buff to damage feels like heaven on Earth. The boss fight is a slog, but with careful positioning, I'm able to annihilate the battlefield. The destruction I bought upon that Hydra when paired with my Well of Radiance was disgusting. This wouldn't even hold up in a court of law. This was personal, downright evil, a violation of the Geneva Conventions. After the Hydra gets double dicked by the Phoenix Protocol Damage Traveler's combo, I destroy some Vex cubes and move on to this arena. God, the lighting in this DLC is gorgeous. I mean, just look at this shit. Bungie then pranks me by placing the bane of a Guardian's existence, a Scorpius turret on top of the Strand Anomaly, but I've got cat-like reflexes and only panicked a lot. The Shadow Legion in their infinite wisdom decided not to take the route made by schoolgirls like the Vex did and instead decided that the best method would be to apply some fucking chest hair and just bomb the facility. One of the best methods to turn off the Neo Muna power grid would be to delete it from the universe via large explosions. You can tell that the Guardians really don't value the concept of life as immediately upon entering this room, laced with more explosives than a train based in the US. We start blasting! After all the ads in this room meet Papa Rise Pea Shooter Justice, they decide it's time to send in the big guns and airdrop in two tormentors to fight me. Little did the Cabal know that I am morbidly a beast. <laughs> <laughs> Using the choking I just received from the Tormentors as a tool for self-improvement, I follow the ancient teachings of improvise, adapt, come, and kill one of the Tormentors with careful positioning. When the other comes to claim victory where his brother couldn't, I give him the Bethesda enemy treatment, a certified get tormented idiot moment. Little did I know that this encounter would signify the last time I would feel joy in my life, as this quickly dies from the heights of I'm a certified killer, a downright felon, straight up predatory like a Minecraft YouTuber, to a I'd rather pull down my pants, spread my cheeks and cannonball onto a cactus then undertake the emotional and physical torment this run would unleash upon my soul. I bolt out of the facility at Mach 8 as the whole facility was rigged to blow. My ghost shouts at me to now right. but being directionally challenged I immediately veer to the left and when I get to the top I blast some barrels behind the Shadow Legion blocking my escape. This causes a chain reaction making the building explode in glorious cinematic fashion. Upon hitting the ground I stress myself too hard once again with Strand and shit my pants. I look back at the explosion thinking wasn't I here to save the reactor? That place just blue sky high. This doesn't exactly feel like a W considering the goals. It's like Rohan saying, Guardian, we need you to save the reactor from the Vex's cubes. And I go, all right, Rohan, don't worry, I solved the issue. I blew the facility up. And Rohan goes, Guardian, are you kidding me? That's fucking rad. <laughs> Pretty much how it went. <laughs> On the Verge has us moving to an ancient religious site of the Neo Mooney people, where the Cloud Striders go to attune a bit more with the universe. These fools needed a sacred location to achieve Nirvana, but I've solved that issue years ago when I transcended beyond humanity. By getting a USB in on the first try. This mission has me utilizing Strand in the opening sections, which immediately severely nerfs my damage output. As a Warlock main, any difficult activity taking away my Well of Radiance is like
like stealing the wheels off my Hot Wheels car and expecting me to drive. This cum stain of damage output is starting to lose even more potency as we move through the levels. Bungie then decides to send an entire army of metal automatons against the guy with an airsoft gun. Look at him out here. Look at this shit. <laughs> this is hell. For some reason, the intrusive thoughts take over and I just decided to springboard myself into the sea. Truly, my goals are beyond comprehension. An hour later, when the Vex lay in ruins and the gate is open, my strand is improved to the next level, which sounds like a good thing. But my dear Hot Wheels disciple, this became pure pain very quickly. I web sling across the sky, misjudging the properties of the grapple many times, and it is here where we are faced with our first real roadblock. A roadblock that is nigh impenetrable. So far in every challenge run, there has always been a workaround of problems that would arise. Bungie and their raging hard on for Strand, which is rightfully so because much like Shrek, this subclass fucks. They placed a Vex Oracle that can only be destroyed by a tangle. Creating a tangle puts us in a bit of a tangle ourselves because you cannot do it without using an ability to get a kill. I tried squeezing myself through the roof and grappling around to the other side, but I was once again shut down by Uncle Bungie, as they truly did think of everything. So I had to put my head to the grindstone, think beyond what was capable, and look beyond the depths of the game engine to unlock my true potential, which is why I'm bribing you again. <laughs> Whoever gets it, share it with a friend. Tell them Papa Rai sent you. Also, think fast, Chuckle Nuts. People are gonna get mad at me if I keep just flashbanging them every video. It's not a Riley Reloaded video if you're not blinded at 3 a.m. This whole mission is about mastering the power of Strand and unlocking the secrets of this new form of attack. Because of this, Bungie decided to up the enemy density and ability regen in order to let you go wild in this arena. With the challenge run restrictions making me reconsider sticking a fork into an outlet, this becomes a huge limiter. There is also oracles that spawn that can only be destroyed by tangles, further invalidating the run. Bungie, you make Riley angry. My healing in this arena was so significantly nerfed, which had the side effect of disrupting my DPS. Now with my strand upgraded, my rift causes threadlings to spawn in. Threadlings that will sniff a fart on the other side of the universe to track it down and kill whatever caused it. The Vex army in this arena met a slow, agonizing end as I waited to recover and dealt my meager DPS from a range this gun is incapable of fighting at. But since this isn't a darkness zone, I can abuse my immortality to some extent. This all changes once the room flips to a darkness zone, with a boss fight added in the mix. I am then joined by Ultra Tough Geico, who upon entering immediately beefs up the enemies to 11. But because I've learned my lessons in the Lightless run, when Trollzord and Howie join me during the second to last mission of the Witch Queen, I content vault his ass faster than me deleting one of my years old characters for a challenge run. With their gear still on them, in my never ending quest to commit war crimes, I discovered a brand new method to further my goals and violate the Geneva suggestions by summoning these threadlings into the universe and then just throwing them off a cliff, allowing me to heal. In the middle of the fight, I remember that Bungie in a twab ages ago stated that full auto would be able to be applied to any weapon and immediately forgot about it because I like to have an adaptive fire rate on my triggers. But in a run like this, I figured it might be useful to turn on so I don't disintegrate the trigger on my controller, which was already starting to squeak a little, a little bit louder than normal. And I dove into the settings to apply it. After that, I used the regenerative power of a warlock to be the good dad that I am and fling thousands of my children into the abyss. To give you an idea of how much of my life this gun whittled away as I popped the boss like a zit, I've sped this footage up to three times, but with persistence I was able to beat the boss with only a damage travelers chosen. Osiris reflects on lessons learned in one of the only great moments of character development in this entire DLC. Him missing Sagira and feeling grief is an amazing touch that would have hit even harder had Bungie learned their lessons and treated characters and their deaths with respect instead of blips on a lore page. Rohan then walks in, the being a warrior of the Chadley type, standing at nine feet tall and packing a magnum dong, styling on the decrepit geezer, who's been yelling at me to understand Strand and cease being a little bitch, even though I'm trying my best out here. <laughs> Rohan immediately turns his attention to something that the Cabal are flying in called the Radial Mast, but since this DLC has been a straight up sausage fest the entire time, my Radial Mast is flying at half sail. Cannons on the left side, get down Edward! No time left is a mission of all time. Throughout my Lightfall Damage Traveler's Chosen Adventures, things have been somewhat survived. Even the worst of it had its workarounds, but nothing could have prepared me for this mission. I'm a pretty resilient Hot Wheels warrior, insanely high mental fortitude, using any pain I experience as the opportunity to learn and grow into something larger than I was before. But this mission, this mission broke me. I'm damn near impossible to get to. The kind of disciple that you could walk in, stab me in the kidneys, and I'd probably say, <laughs> after filing a restraining order and a lengthy recovery, hashtag save Riley's kidney. But there are a few things that would make me want to 
to eat an entire tub of Tide Pods more than this mission. The enemies were now reaching their peak strength, able to take an entire magazine before falling. I was still able to demolish my way across the battlefield at a steady enough pace. The Cabal couldn't have comprehended what was coming for them as I pelted away their shields and then their health with thousands of tiny BBs. Once the room was clear, I made for Strand. Setting up a healing rift in this location was a bad move as the tank called my bluff from a mile away, sending me straight to God. Honestly, that's a pretty good play on the tank's part. Terrible positioning for me. When I return, all the enemies lay dead and I once again fail the challenge by having to use Strand to kill the super suppression field. But this has the side effect of spawning threadlings that immediately go for the jugular on the tank. I tried a couple of times, but I always wound up ending the exact same way. So after the tank met its end and I was airdropped in some artillery, I blast the door open and get ready for the actual work. That's right. This mission was centered around tanks. Balanced around tanks. And I'm gonna fucking walk it. <laughs> you see where the problems are coming from now? The vehicles in this area deal some immense damage to my corporeal form. The interceptor styled on me more times than I could count. Outplayed it nearly every time I would return. Sometimes when I would try to run away, they would just use some Vex prediction engine level shit and shoot for where I was going, not where I was, and blast me into the stratosphere. It was then I ran alongside one of the fuel cells you're supposed to destroy and got my asshole punched in by an interceptor bolt, but in a twist of fate, it caused the fuel cell to explode, meaning a new tactic was born and I once again get to abusing my immortality. Once the way was clear, I got out of there, activated the turbos on my Mario Kart, and rocketed away in happiness, knowing that the pain was over. Only my donkey ass should have known that this was only the beginning and should have mentally prepared for the assault I was about to face. Bungie and their never-ending quest to kick me in the throat put a tank at the end of a bridge guarded by two threshers. At the time of recording, thresher damage was tied to frame rate, meaning that if you played anything faster than a trials player repulsing females, you wouldn't even see death coming before you just die. Thankfully, this wasn't a darkness zone, but the entire magazine of a damaged traveler's chosen barely even fucking registered as damage against these. When I tried to secure a spot to shoot from, a phalanx decided to once again go against the deep state and bash my skull in. <laughs> it's just a trickle effect of bullshit. <laughs> After I clear my vantage point to shoot from, the threshers decided to delete my cover from existence, which I thought was something that was exclusively something I could do. I littered the battlefield with tombstones and crushed dreams, but eventually made my way across the bridge, placing a well of radiance to take on the tank. The tank said, nice try, asshole, and scattered my body all over the fucking highway. Would you believe this Hot Wheels parking lot prophet if I told you that this wasn't it, that what was coming was even worse? The tormentor in the bay right after the tank and the bridge were easy to take down with the skills I've developed, as long as I play slow and steady. But when we leave the hangar, it is here I am introduced to my own personal hell. Oh god, the nightmares, the numbers, Mason, what do they mean? This is a darkness zone with not only phalanxes guarding each other, interceptors that will shoot you if you disrespect their territory, a tank that needs to meet a cruel end in the back, but also not one, not two, nay, three, but four threshes. To say the amount of damage this area did to my ego was anything other than catastrophic would be lying. The pain was immense. You'd be strolling around at a slow and steady pace and a thresher would decide that your ticket to existence was punched and put you on the back of a milk cart. Each run of this room taking around 40 minutes of fighting just to lose it all at the end. I would use this tank to avoid getting blasted only to leave the tank to continue my assault and get blasted anyway. <laughs> Death taking you all the way back to the beginning. There are a few encounters I'd wish to suck me good and hard through my jorts more than this atrocity to human decency. Normally I'm a beacon of unyielding ability to continue in the face of adversity but this shit broke me so hard that I retreated to Sons of the Forest, a cannibal ridden island where your most sane player is still a guy who puts heads under sticks, and I built myself a little life and peaceful cabin in the woods, just taking in nature's beauty while I allow my butthole to unstretch. <laughs> Eventually though, I felt the calling to return to my higher purpose, because as it is written in the ancient Riley Reloaded text, Mama didn't raise no bitch, and I returned to the fight. My spirit was still fractured with the scars that will never heal, but eventually I got my footing and surpassed my mortal limits. Watch as Rohan does what every Titan main fantasizes of by sprinting through a wall in crayon fueled aggression. I'm the juggernaut, bitch! And on the way to the boss room, Osiris struggles to read his lines, saying, You and Rohan are our only hope. You and Rohan are our only hope. After writing my own scripts, I feel this on a deeper level because I often put two words like that together and think, kind of ass monkey would string these two words together. And the actual boss fight for this mission is a pushover. It gets annihilated without much pain. The health pool is less than the Vex boss, and the damage I deal in a well of radiance is enough to not make me want to throw to cactus. The only real trouble being the shielded incendiaries in the tunnels and the tanks that spawn, but you can strategically place yourself to take them down relatively quickly, I erupt into strand and immediately get a tummy ache and stumble my way towards Rohan. Oh no, that guy I spent two minutes of screen time with is sacrificing himself. Please! 
Please! Now! Adios, boss. Bungie really didn't help this character development enough to make us care for him. We learned that Cloud Striders only lived for 10 years after accepting the service, and that Rohan was already on year 9 of his tenure. All I'm saying is, is I'd probably blow my ass up too if I knew the due date was coming. The emotional severity of this is cut short even further when Nimbus says, Well, he's dead, and I don't listen to dead people. Honestly, good advice. They expand on this in the post-campaign missions, but it might have been a bit late for that. Nimbus, the last remaining defender of this city, decides that on entrance, he would shred someone's apartment in order to be stylish. I'm then hit with Buzz Light, you're saying, While Osiris helps me to untangle this strand. <laughs> Which I know, they were going for an 80s action movie, but for what was supposed to be the Collapse 2.0, this has some insane tonal whiplash. I was such a defender of the Witch Queen and its storytelling because they were nailing dialogue between characters and building this amazing narrative. You had the deep tones of Zavala asking hard-hitting questions, like maybe we aren't supposed to live this long. Have I made the right choices? I don't regret all the good the city has done, or that I was a part of it. But what it took to get here... What it's taken to keep it. Our minds weren't meant for this many years. Like so many other things, we have a word for eternity. Without the capacity to comprehend what it actually means. When is enough? Enough. Maybe it's time to let go. The fun interactions between Drifter and Ido, backgrounds into the past of this amazing cast and gut-wrenching endings, like the one we got in Season of the Seraph that left everyone excited for the next installment of Destiny. I loved the seasonal storytelling so much that I even took inspiration from it when I was writing dialogue for my own characters in the Lightless series. I understand what it's like, even when you can't depend on yourself, for what it's worth. Your voice was a comfort in the dark, you know. Trying to leave mystery, but still somehow weave a narrative together. My point is, is that it was masterfully done. I even said this a day before Lightfall came out at meeting. And I also very much love this scene. Bungie has been so good with characters lately that everyone is believable and nuanced. You see so much improvement from before that it is literally night and day. Zavala and Ikora were boards for years without much depth. But now after each season, showing their strengths and weaknesses, and only improving the narrative as we move further and further towards the final shift. It is crazy to look back at what they've managed to do with something that many would have considered to be unsalvageable only a few mere years ago. It shows that if you put in the work and try your best, anything is capable of change for the better. Something I find comforting in my hours of need. Hell, if No Man's Sky and Destiny 2 can do it, maybe I can too. I had so many comments saying, Papa Rye, that shit age like milk. <laughs> I could agree more. I'm unsure when Thanos came in and snapped away half of Lightfall's story, but I can tell about a single mission ago was when the story began to unravel. Now it'll be up to the godly lore nerds of Destiny to patch all the holes better than Bungie could ever hope to with speculation and creative writing on the level of god-tier novelists. I fully believe that if Uncle Bungie decided to say that this is a filler expansion until we can fully build the final shape and didn't market it like the beginning of the end of the light and dark saga, then this would have been received as much better as people would be understanding they want to cap off the light and dark saga right. This Steam review still had me laughing though. Witness this. Witness that. Bro, let me witness a good story. <laughs> the whole Lightfall fiasco has me thinking about the gold Golden Ages and Destiny, things like the Taken King, Forsaken, and again with the Witch Queen. I'm on team Take Your Time Bungie to release things. I always prefer quality over quantity. It's something that I apply with my videos, which is why I disappear for so long creating these. I hope they're good. <laughs> Osiris then gives a Riley Reloaded inspirational speech about opening our palms and flowing like your mother after I show her my god rolls, learning the ins and outs of Strand, even though a couple of missions ago we went to the Neo Mooney sacred place to master the subclass. Osiris uses his next level understanding of the threads of the universe to untangle the fucking game, and we head towards the Vex network to complete our training arc. The amount of Vex that Bungie decided to send my way was asinine. Holy fuck, look at that army. I can't even poke my head out before they've pressure washed my ass off the sidewalk. I spent about 45 minutes hammering away at the Legion of Vex until I finally cleared the battlefield. Despite that though, I thought this mission was going to be a bit tougher than it was. It was more of a battle of endurance than anything. I just keep slinging myself along the sky from platform to platform, firing my dinky little pistol into the big Minotaur when I get the chance and dealing the damage that a turkey slap would. And after about an hour and a half of fearing for my controller's battery lifespan, sending me back to the beginning as I hop from side to side, I cleared both the boss and Osiris's training program, beating headlong with only a damage traveler's chosen. Finally, in the last mission of the DLC, I aligned the gaming chakra and learned that there is a piercing sidearm mod in the seasonal artifact that allows the traveler's chosen to fire through Phalanx's shields and shields surrounding Vex Hydra's. The gloves were fucking off. It was like rock 
Chuck Lee taking off the weights. And even though I've spent the better part of 16 hours ramming my head into a wall for your sick enjoyment, I find myself once again getting sentimental as I ride my little go-kart across the Neo Muna streets. If there is one thing I have to give Bungie credit for, it's that no matter what the subject matter is, their art direction is bar none some of the most beautiful art direction that I've seen in gaming. This soundtrack is also enough to make the angels cry. Even after almost a decade, Bungie is always willing to push the boundaries of what amazing art and music direction can do. The volumetric lighting, glistening with the neon lights of the city, have a somberness to them that is oddly peaceful, yet beautiful. Overlooking the colossal negative reception of Lightfall, there is still so much beauty and fun to be had in something that Bungie has created like this. Something that I'm trying to appreciate more. I often find myself rushing and have to force myself to stop and look around at the smaller, more neglected details, not just in the game, but in real life as well. So many times I think about the fact that I may not be where I thought I would be, and find myself alleviating the feelings of being unsatisfied at the things I've managed to achieve when I stop for a moment and smell the flowers. It's a lesson in appreciation and gratitude that despite my best efforts, I'm still trying to learn. Some of the greatest ways I've been able to rise to any occasion in my life was holding heart and soul at the forefront of my being, realizing that when the beacons weren't lit and the darkness was overwhelming, that those who chose to blaze the trail and be the light at the end of the tunnel were best suited to stand against the unyielding torrent that was sure to come. As I've said before, those that wield the damage travelers chosen and don the Hot Wheels color scheme do not lie down and accept defeat in the face of insurmountable odds. We do not bow to the cruel and different reality of the universe. We stand with our chests, hearts at the ready to weather any weakness, any foe. My soldiers don't lie down and accept defeat. My soldiers will bear witness to the possibility of a brighter tomorrow. And for those that would stand in our way, I'm coming for you. I demolish my way across the rooftops, get launched off the edge by an incendiary, and pull some magical bullshit directly out of my ass and get tormented idiot the tormentor. We then enter the final last stand where Keitel engages the forces of her father with you in an epic battle. I love everything about this. It's a cinematic battle that really has all pistons firing. When the Ascendant Guard rolls in, I can just kick it at the back of the room, taking pot shots at the enemies until the area is clear. I try to drop a well of radiance on this cabal to save him, but the tank vaporizes him before I can save his life. The enemies in the final area are at their strongest, but the damage travelers chose taking many bullets to put down a single enemy. Thankfully, Bungie finally sent me off with a warning by giving me a turret and Keitel's Ascendant Guard to fight for me. And after so much of my life that I'll never get back, and clowning on two tormentors, many tanks, and enough shielded enemies to shit directly into my cornflakes, Callus pushes Keitel and I back against the wall, blowing open the doors to the veil. Keitel decides to hold the line and I descend into the bunker to find the veil. This has to be one of my favorite things to come out of the Lightfall campaign. Completely shit the bed with the writing, but this had so much environmental storytelling in it, it was delicious. One of my favorite things in Destiny is when you feel small in a universe that feels so much larger than you, and this takes us through time to see the past as it was around the time humanity fell for the first time, and hitting this Ishtar Collective logo is such an amazing detail, showcasing that there was so much more to us before everything fell. To think of all the history that was lost as we were busy just trying to survive on our home. I then equipped some new drip because throughout this entire run I've been completely lacking in this department, and continue through this beautiful bunker. We then get hit with yet another visual splendor of the veil. It looks amazing. The way this room is composed and lit is yet another example of why the art team at Bungie is bar none. I love just walking in upon this. Crawling through this golden age facility untouched through time is such a good concept that I wish Destiny had more of. And I'm not talking about these larger than life things like the Sarah bunkers. I mean things that are more like buildings, residential areas, getting to see what humanity had as the collapse arrived. But it is here we find our final stand with Callus, a formidable foe whenever you face them, with a legion of ads that will melt you down. I knew for a fact this was going to be one of the biggest battles that I would have in the entire Destiny franchise. Strand significantly lowers my ability to fight off the enemies within this arena. Bungie demolishing any semblance of happiness that I could have in my lifetime during the Thresher mission made sure that I would be able to persevere through this fight. I used every card and trick I had in the book to survive, not even reaching the damage threshold that causes the Tormentors to spawn in. Every time I would think I had Callus in the ropes, I would get one shot by his gun. After my next death, I had to come up with a better way, so I dove deep within the depths on the internet. With my achievements in Destiny, I've been called Walmart Jesus, the We Have Esoteric at Home of Destiny, and to further hammer this nail in the coffin, you bet your ass that I stole a tip from the guru himself by getting a little stinky with it and heading underneath these stairs to whittle down Callus, shooting him through the slits in the stairs in which his gun wasn't able to get through. If my mother saw me playing like this, she would absolutely beat my ass, because I took the path laid out for Turbo Virgins. Not a single chest hair in this method. But you tell me who's cheesing it more. 
I've got a dinky little sidearm, and Callus has a literal darkness cannon. After learning this method, I continue to whittle away countless hours of my life that I'll never get back, and realize just how little damage I deal. It would have taken me forever to hit hard enough to kill Callus, just because I took the route made for schoolgirls. Bungie decides that all that progress I made should be for naught, and Callus curves the bullet wanted style through the blades of the stairs, vaporizing me in a single shot. Nice one, Callus. This is clearly a case of skill issue. After my death, I return with Strand to complete phase two of this cheese, and continue firing thousands of tiny bullets into the brain of Callus. Once the root is about to fall down, I completely whiff my grapple and sling myself off into the void, which was damn near soul-crushing after the amount of time I just spent firing this gun. But when I return, I'm able to mantle on the outside of the dome and begin just firing down upon Callus. I rain death from above. Once I plant Callus like a tree, I hop, skip, and jump, clapping my hands in front of him because I'm a happy little light bear. The rest of the crew rolls up, and despite Nimbus physically making me cringe because he tried to fist bump Keitel after we just put about a thousand bullets in her dad's head, my ghost begins to float up towards the veil to complete the link. Nimbus tells me to shoot it, but I swear there was about all the time before this that Nimbus could have grabbed my ghost. Shoot it, motherfucker, you can fly! Plus, this is a Kvostov. Ghost probably would have just tanked the bullet. Afterwards, you think there would be a bit more of an emotional ending where Keitel is pissed off that we didn't take the shot, considering all the sacrifices that she had to make, and we couldn't commit to this simple one. To literally save existence as we know it. Or that Nimbus was inept and didn't fly up there despite flying in moments before on his silver surfboard. Much like the rest of the Destiny community, I'm just gonna turn off my disbelief and imagine it better in my head. And it's kind of weird because in The Witch Queen, when I finally put down the final boss, I stand back, feeling like a god as I get that majestic cutscene with the Traveler in the sky as I loom victorious over my defeated foe. It just ends, leaving me to revel in the glory. Then the witness enters the Traveler's Travusi without consent, and I beat Lightfall with only a damage Traveler's Chosen. Now I want to thank my patrons for supporting me while I dropped off the face of the earth for a time. I do this in my spare time whenever I'm off of work, and as much as I'd like to say I'm a beacon of unyielding energy, sometimes I do tend to run myself a little bit thin. So I'm extremely thankful for all of you that support me along the way in this. I said, if this ever went full time, you guys have had trouble getting rid of me, being your games 24-7. I still want to do a thank you video for the Lightless series, and I'm even thinking about releasing it as a single movie with the bloopers added into the end. I'm going to call the Lightless thank you video a Rydoc. <laughs> Come on, that's good. Come that's good. It'll be a Vidoc parody and just be fantastic. I wanted the ending of Lightless to hurt, so I made sure not to do a Patreon read and let the weight of what happened set in. But now that we are so back in the swing of things, maybe I can start slinging off names again. So I want to give a huge shout out to Doorman is God, Reject Claude, Brett Tabrizi, Darth C, Delta Shell, Marasov Strapon. You're making me say that, really. <laughs> Kiyu Twee, Grenshu, Nicholas Cockamiglio, <laughs> Zero Kelvin, Adeptus Igni, Kiani Burkett, IV Omega IV, Mark Man. Macri, Exo Warlock, George Neely, Extron, you beautiful bastard, Jay Pfeiffer, Preston Rhodes, Nitron, Patches 3, Lalo Salamanca, It Was You, Wumpus, The Friendless, Wildfire, 56, <laughs> Dr. Dinky, Agenda, Cameron Spoon, Phantom Nuva, Moose Master, Master of Meese, God, I wanted to say that in Lightless so bad, Drand and Bethany Arcana, Dragon Boy SD, Chase Kilday, Fishilala, <laughs> Zerlin, Vibronius Michael, Alex Gark, Ash Incendia, Legend of Swoop, Zeriak, Ogstratus, Casper, Kaper, Warizwa, War, War, War fuck, <laughs> Bilbo, James Hardy, Ahegao Kurimi, Tolly, Riley from Berta, Stephen Wagner, Xavier, Ibrahim Altwiri, Grumpy Grandpa, Jonathan Schultz, Heroglyph, Ixis, Fenbuskis P, Dem Dirty Blues, Major Brain Damage, Geo Polichinel, Octa 6K, Insert Name Here, Alex Smith, Ahmed Albashri, Zombie Fox, Conquer Reloaded, Jack Mage, Arik McMeyer, Saint of Good RNG, Eslepius, Zyno, Pathetic Mango, Momo No Legs, It's Game Boy 365, Gucci, Founder of the Knights of Reloaded. That's great. If that's an actual clan, that's amazing. Lee, Woodman the Splinter, Not a Cardboard Box, Asli Elks, Magneto, Your Friend Steven, Sir Depresso, Chris Haley, Micah, US Navy Squid, Luke Sturch, Enter Your Name 94, Sharky, Matt Herrick, Later, Gamma Rad, Cameron Scholes, Mr. Captain McDaddy Clutch. The amazing Rikon 6. Zuppel Toppler, I'm telling I'm gonna kill you. What are you fucking doing? I'm gonna get banned off of YouTube. People <laughs> KXNG Kitty Bitty. Garrett Kane. Demetrius. Joshua Greenlee. Pepsi Main. Magneto. A flat surface. Uncertain. Judd. NT Pin Hero. The Cosmic Essence. Arliss McGuire. Zarin King. Sensei Smalls. Mordant. T7 Code 99. IB Stevie. Jonathan Blaylock. Cozy. From the Schmazzy Wazzy Mazzy. 
Heyman Smith broke a rib and punctured your lung. Mattel scanned Hot Wheels while he caught blood, but congratulations, you did it. I'm amazed this one actually fit, Liz. <laughs> Lamotion, Riley Sheldon, Jay Lack, Boston, Azure Knight, Lone Ranger, 2412, Capone went to sea, got a better job, and still won't pay Riley. He's sleeping with the fishes now. Eat the money. I don't need V. Tekka, the, <laughs> the model is so fun. I can't believe I still haven't gotten that shit to you. God, Cosmic was like, where's my goddamn shirt, Riley, for like three days after he beat that challenge run. Or for three months. As you can see, I'm fashionably on time. You're gonna be like 10 years later, just gonna be sitting there and a mug's gonna show up. Link. Dank devastation. We miss you, man. Zerks 14A. Max C. Nadian Syrup. X9, 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 X9. Ben Stanfield. Hecate. XD7228. Kari Simpson. Caleb Warman. Kevin Noda. Fish. That was a weak fish. I gotta do it better. Fish. My neighbors are gonna hate me. <laughs> ben me. Eden's Gate. Your boy, Gamer Weenus. Nathan Dacia. Delegator Valkeen. Thrumund and Dragon Waffle. I really hope you guys are doing very well. Hot Wheels Enthusiast. Kefnet the Useless. Nathaniel Farmer. Curious Lich. CO Camo 3. Arson is Cringe. Rin Hale. Crimbo the Undying. Madeline Celestia. Some Dude with a Scarf. Bogos Bintis. Super Steven. The Very Same. Mondo 117. James Escalante. Brighton. Omega Null. Some Archie Desk Hopper. Nan. Lost the Bob. Xavier Human. And Fufu Accio. You guys are amazing for helping me create things that I never thought would be possible. Even if I'm not all there with communication. Like I said, I'm scrambling 90% of the time. Just getting to sit down and create this stuff for you is probably one of my joys in life. I love editing and writing scripts and stories. It's probably one of my favorite things to do. And I really am thankful for the fact that you guys help me do this more. I am working on that front, so stay with me while I iron out some details. <laughs> Huge thanks to my chronophobia admins, Cosmic and Zeno, for doing great work on the server. We even have another faction war brewing in there, so if you're interested in competing, representing either the Ishtar Collective or Braytech, feel free to join up. You never know when you'll run into me. I like to frequent the server and chat in there. With that being said, I've been Papa Rai. Thank you for watching and allowing me to be your Hot Wheels provider, and I'll catch you in the next one.